concept of being overly full is um, connected with... Dr. Beck, by inventing cognitive therapy, has allowed many sufferers of depression to lead normal lives again, and certainly he's prevented thousands of suicides. Actually, I got into uh, the field of psychotherapy quite by accident. I had never intended to be a psychotherapist. I had wanted to be a neurologist. And what I loved about neurology is that it was possible to be a, do a very thorough clinical examination. And then based on those observations, you could pinpoint the exact precise lesion in the brain or the rest of the central nervous system where the problem was. And so when I was then told that I had to do six months of psychiatry, I fought it for a while, but I got into it. And in the course of time, I got really intrigued by psychiatry, but I felt I had invested six months into psychiatry and I didn't fully understand it. And my colleague said, well, you gotta get psychoanalyzed because that's the only way you can really understand people. And once you get psychoanalyzed, it'll clear up all the problems because you're gonna be able to undo all of the unconscious problems that are plaguing you right now. So I applied to the Philadelphia Psychoanalytic Institute. I got accepted. And at the end of my training time, I thought, well, I really do understand people. But there's so many people out there who don't believe in psychoanalysis, particularly the academic people who have no use for psychoanalysis. I was going to prove to them that psychoanalysis was the solid basis for treating patients. Now, at that time, there were two schools of thought in treating uh, people with depression and other mental disorders. One school of thought was so-called organic school, who would put electrodes on the patient's brains, treat them with electric shock, lobotomy, all of what we call the somatic treatments. Then there was the other school of thought, which had really taken over, which was psychoanalysis. And I thought so many people could really be helped if they only knew about psychoanalysis and if the scientifically oriented people would go along and see that this was an empirically validated, that it was a scientifically based therapy. Well, the question was, how do you prove that a therapy is scientific? It occurred to me that I could look at depression, which was the most common mental illness at the time, and see if any, see which of the psychoanalytic theories really held water, or Put another way, whether I could test the psychoanalytic theory and determine whether the psychoanalytic theory was correct, because I believed that it was correct. But all that was necessary was to find the tools to prove it. How do you prove that a psychoanalytic theory is correct? You look at the dreams. And I had a way of measuring hostility in the dreams. Now, the psychoanalytic theory of dreams is that people have a well of unconscious hostility which they're directing towards one other person whom they're close to, or maybe several people. But this hostility is threatening to them and they feel very guilty about it, and so they repress it, which would seem very natural. Once they repress it, it gets turned around against the self and it makes the person feel all sorts of bad things about themselves makes them feel suicidal, takes away their appetite, and so on. So I thought it was a very simple formulation. All that I needed to do was to prove that there was hostility in the dreams. However, when I did the dream study, I discovered that the depressed patients who had dreams had less hostility in their dreams than the non-depressed people. And this completely baffled me. So I looked around at the dreams again, and then I saw an anomaly, quite the opposite of patients expressing hostility to other people. They saw themselves in the dreams as deprived, defeated, frustrated, thwarted, and so on. They saw themselves as the victims of other people's bad doings. Well, I wondered, what could this be? Did they have a need to suffer? And that's why they were doing this. So we did a whole series of experiments which tried to tease out whether there was still something unconscious that I wasn't getting at that was producing these bad dreams. Well, I totally failed at that. There was nothing I could do that could show any other origin of uh, 
the negative dreams, except that this was the way the people saw themselves in the dreams. But then, very simple-mindedly, I recognized that the negative appearance in the dream was the same way people saw themselves in regular life. In real life, they saw that they would be defeated. When they weren't actually defeated, they would exaggerate little minor things to reflecting on their own worthlessness. And when they were faced with what they thought were insurmountable obstacles, they would think that suicide was the only way out. Well, there then seemed to be a common theme. From the dream, where the person perceived himself, had this negative representation of himself as worthless, carrying it all the ways over to his waking life, that there was this constant theme. So then the question came up, so that was the big anomaly. The question came up, can you do anything about it? Well, at this point, it occurred to me that if I was going to do anything about this, I had to really be able to interact directly with the patient. And so instead of having them on the couch where they would be free associating and talking about their early life and their sexual experiences, maybe if I sat them up, we could just talk person to person and we could, they could tell me about their various beliefs about themselves, which to my mind were clearly distorted, exaggerated, twisted, and so on. Now, what was interesting was that in a very short period of time, when they started getting a different mindset about their various thoughts, their sadness started to go away, the guilt went away, they, their appetite came back, they slept better at night, and in 10 or 12 sessions, they were over the depression.